I'm going to be painting very broad strokes here, uh, Jewish intellectual and pietistic networks or uh, activity, basically, specifically in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, I'm sort of asking this general question. I had not considered it previously, um, but was there a Jewish Republic of Letters and not basically taking the notions of Republics of Letters and then seeing if it's possible to apply it um, to Jew Jewish circumstances. It happens to be and I'll get to it in a second. There have been scholars who have done this. They've referred to a rabbinic republic of letters. Um, I question whether this is really appropriate and hopefully I'll be able to, uh, to go through this and I look forward to hearing your comments. Uh, just to begin, so Jewish communities in the early modern period, we're talking about no, um, there's no specific place that Jews are, are in residence. There's wide geographic settlement, there's shifting cultural centers, uh, the, the Jews were expelled in the middle, medieval period from England and much of France. And by the end of the 15th century, there's the Iberian expulsions. Uh, so there are settlements in and major cultural centers in Amsterdam and in Istanbul and Prague and Venice and elsewhere. There are Jews in North Africa and in Yemen. And there is a common heritage and religion and history and textual traditions. Um, and in each of these cases, we're talking, in general, what we're looking at is that there are Jewish communities that have communal autonomy. Um, but what this creates is a diverse and complex identities where there's sort of, um, with the constant shifts and the fact that Jews are, uh, that there are different political borders and there are different ethnicities and traditions that develop, uh, the, 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 there's sort of a question as to what pan-Jewishness means uh, and what are its limitations? At least this, these are the questions that I've been asking recently. Uh, so there are economic and familial and intellectual and rabbinic networks that run across political borders um, and cultural borders and even ethnic borders. However, um, it's difficult to find exactly what this means. Where is the Jewishness? What is the thing that binds all Jews together in this context? Um, but there is then this question, and some scholars in recent years have referred to a rabbinic republic of letters because there are learned communities, there's communication and cooperation. And of course, there's an implicit relationship between Jewish communities and their larger societies. What I hope to do now is to give some background as to what Jewish intellectual life was like, um, what it sort of traditionally, and then how things were changing and ultimately an erosion to the rabbinate. And then I'll give, for the, Dirk mentioned uh, Moses Chaim Lutzato, uh, I'll give a few minutes, hopefully, just using that as a case study um, to really address the, these questions about whether there can be something called a rabbinic republic of letters. To begin with, though, uh, hold on one sec, sorry. To begin with, though, there, there's uh, Jewish traditional historical, or excuse me, scholarship, traditional scholarship was ahistorical. Uh, there's a concept of mispara de lepanab, which basically means that uh, the person engaged in scholarship, the intention was to bring all generations prior into a present day ongoing conversation. So that the individual um, intellectuals who are engaged in some Jewish uh, discussion, albeit law or theology, would speak in the present tense about, about people who had written prior. Um, there's actually is still an ongoing emotional um, community is there's still an ongoing habit of referring rather than to individuals referring to the, the books and the individual is the book they refer to people by the names of the books and the, the, the historical context is irrelevant. Uh, this is something that went on for for centuries, um, if not millennia. Uh, but it, it, it's intensified and sort of manifested with the, in the, with the rise of print. The two examples that I've shown here are on the left is a rabbinic Bible. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but on the, on the left is this Bible where the biblical text is right here in the bottom, uh, and it is surrounded by commentaries, and the commentaries are, are sometimes engaged with each other, but the fact is, is that on the page, what happens is that the person who is involved in this uh, sort of it all comes to life and, the, and, and the, the, the imagination is that everyone is in the room with you at that moment. On the right side, you see the Talmud. Now, obviously the Bible, we're talking about an ancient text. The, the Talmud is something that was codified in, in around 600 CE. 
but this is something similar, surrounded by commentary and those and, and early modern rabbinic scholarship. Um, it just continue to add on and uh, add commentary, super commentary upon other commentaries and uh, indices to help with the in entire enterprise. But it was a it was a, an, an enterprise in 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 the present, so to speak. Okay, with print, of course, though there's growing literacy, and what comes from this is connected to the fact that Jews are so widespread. Uh, and constantly moving is that there's decentralized authority. You have cases where there are large communities. Venice is a perfect example where there was several, at least 5,000 Jews in, in the early modern period. Amsterdam had maybe 3,000. Istanbul or Constantinople had many, many more. Uh, but there are Jews who are settled in very small towns throughout uh, Central Europe and throughout the Italian peninsula and in North Africa where there's no it could be just family units or a handful of families, and there's no there's no clear intellectual authority, no and certainly no rabbi, and sometimes not a, a, an established synagogue. Uh, and this means that when it comes to law, you might have small treatises of law that are published, and the individuals are the sort of become their own arbiters of law. They literally take the law into their own hands. Um, you have, or figuratively, I guess, not wrong, literal, and. Um, there's interpretation, individual interpretation of the Bible, and even this this even shows up when it comes to esoteric literature, Kabbalah being the mystical, there are mystical texts, uh, and there is a, a dilution of Kabbalistic concepts where individuals who ordinarily would not engage in and not be able to really engage in in the depth of the material, same thing goes with the previous images that I showed when it comes to Talmud or Bible, are able to address this or to, to at least bring it on in some diluted form. And then they it's a part of their own individual life. But what this means is that there's, there's essentially decentralized authority. Concurrently, in larger communities, what you have are, um, of course, libraries. There are really, as far as I can see, three types of libraries. There are private libraries, confraternal, which are sort of semi-public, and communal. The case of a private library, there's a picture here of David Oppenheim. He was the chief rabbi of Prague in the early 18th century. Uh, his collection of 7,000 printed books and about 1,000 manuscripts ended up in the Bodleian. Uh, Josh Toplitsky of Stony Brook University in New York uh, published a book two years ago about that collection, about that library, and Oppenheim's um, power and authority that he, he sort of held through his library. Scholars needed it, needed him, needed his sort of access to knowledge and his permission related to the access to the knowledge. Um, so there's independence to some extent with private libraries, of course, though it's connected, you know, there, there could be authority that, that, that comes with that. <clears throat> Excuse me, you have a, a case of confraternal libraries, which can either be connected to synagogues or independent. Um, in, this, in Jewish communities, you had many types of confraternities. Individuals could be a part of, could belong to different confraternities. And what that meant was that there was an erosion of a clear hierarchy within the community. Um, and then finally, there is at least one case of a communal library, which Derek had mentioned, which I've worked on, uh, called the Eitz Chaim Yeshiva, the Eitz Chaim Academy of the Portuguese community, the Sephardic community in Amsterdam. That was clearly a communal library. It was connected to this academy. The library had an, the academy and the library had an annual budget. There are 140 consecutive years of acquisition lists. Uh, and what comes from the communal side of things, and I would say that it's connected to what's happening with confraternities, is that besides an erosion of a clear hierarchy, uh, there can be also public ambivalence where individuals are simply don't find this interesting if I know relevance to what they what they are personally interested in. And that means that there's an erosion to the authority of rabbinic uh, power. Uh, in addition, there is expanding scholarship among those who among Jewish intellectual leadership, specifically within the rabbinate. Now you this this occurs, of course, in in just the general European early modern context where there's history and bibliography and scientific treatises. Uh, 
this had existed already in the medieval period where rabbis were interested and involved in the study of science and philosophy in particular. However, uh, it's intensified and in a way is compartmentalized to a greater degree. And that contributes to this erosion where there's a clear, what, what might have previously been a clear hierarchy and a clear power structure when it came to intellectual leadership is now evolving, if not diminishing, primarily because the, the individuals that we're talking about who are involved in this expanding scholarship are rabbis themselves, but they have their particular interests that they're pursuing. So what follows in the 18th century, I, as far as I can see, I, I'm not sure if it has taken off in the, in the 17th century yet, but by the 18th century, what we see is that there is not just collaboration between rabbinic leaders, but there's actual alliance. Um, alliances sometimes either against something else or just in terms of, in order to bolster themselves. So for instance, you have a case of, you, there, there's a genre of rabbinic literature called responsa, which dated back to the early Middle Ages, uh, the early medieval period, where an individual or a community may have a question about law or theology or ritual and send that question to a rabbinic authority or to an academy somewhere in a much larger um, com community. That would then be debated and ultimately a decision would be issued and it would be obviously written in manuscript in the period that we're talking about and then disseminated and over time those things would be collected and they would collect collections of these responsa and uh, eventually they found their way into print as it was an ongoing thing though each generation you would have had additional responsa as it went um, this there are response, collections of response that are published in the, in the 16th century, but by the 18th century, what's happening is that instead of individuals who are publishing their own responsa or somebody else, let's say a student or a, a child, a son of a, of a rabbinic leader publishing that, what goes with that answer from the particular rabbinic figure is sort of collaborative or additional uh, statements from other rabbinic figures. In other words, this rabbinic figure is in issuing their ruling, they also are soliciting other, uh, they're soliciting support. Something similar, though a di completely different context happens with book approbations. Again, in the 18th century, this happens where there had been approbations, which are called haskamot in Hebrew, um, that dated back to the mid 16th century following church confiscation, and burning and event and, and ultimately censorship of rabbinic texts. Uh, the initially that the notion was that they would be self censorship that Jews would be that rabbinic figures would uh, approve a work before it was published. But by the 18th century, there's less of a concern of approval for, for the it, with respect to church authority um, or threats from from the church, then self-censorship for the preservation of whatever is regarded as legitimate and printers are very much driving this and authors of their own tech uh, of their own books texts um, but what happens is that there are in 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 contrast to let's say two or three rabbinic approbations for a particular book just to state that this thing is approved and you know that it's legitimate so to speak is you might have pages and pages of, of, uh, of many rabbis from from various uh, geographic regions um, banning, sort of banding together or, or coming together in order to state that there that this is a, that this is legitimate. Um, within this, really, I just wanted to mention that there's there's ethnic and linguistic diversity here. There is no. This gets to this question where, that I raised from the top about the limitations of pan Jewishness. Um, you see that this text on the left is this polyglot Bible. There were two that were published in Constantinople in 15, one in 1546 and one in 1547. Uh, this particular edition comes where you have the biblical text in the center and it's flanked by Judeo uh, Arabic and Judeo Persian translations. And this Passover Haggadah on the right comes with a Judeo Italian translation of the Haggadah. Um, but that same year in Venice, the printers also published, a, it looks exactly the same, a Haggadah that has a Judeo-German, as in Yiddish translation, and a Judeo-Spanish, uh, as in Ladino translation. And the reason is because we're talking about multiple, a multiplicity of audiences here. 
and everything that I was referring to before in terms of the rabbinic um, its own, there's a rabbinic diversity. There's, this is really with, with reference to the just general communal uh, diversity. Um, I just wanted to here use one example for this question of continuity and its limitations. This is a, a, an exam, um, a title page from a folio, very large um, prayer book, a two volume prayer book that was published in Venice between 1711 and 1716. And the printer stated that this is for the holy communities of Italy. They include the Ashkenazic, Sephardic, and Italian communities of Venice, as well as the communities of Padua, Reggio, Verona, Mantua, and, and other places and, and all their environs. In other words, there is a single Jewish something, identity of some sort, uh, but even within Venice, you have distinct communities. In fact, Venice had a situation where separate synagogue congregations had separate charters with the state. And this is one of the reasons it's referring to the Ashkenazic, Sephardic, and Italian communities. These are distinct within Venice, even though they're all living within the ghetto. Uh, Padua technically is under the Venetian state, but the community in that case is not large enough to have separate charters. And therefore you have the Ashkenazic, Sephardic, and Italian distinctions of, or sort of ethnicities all together under a single Polity. Uh, this, what this really shows to me is that this is, there's a concern, or at least an attempt to reach across political boundaries and showing that there is something, there is continuity, but it also clearly demonstrates limitations to that continuity because frankly, Padua and Venice are right next to each other and it could, say, the, the printer could have opted to state this quite more simply. Um, in the remaining few minutes, I just I think I would use just uh, the story of Moses Chaim Lutzato as a case study for what I've been working on related to all of this and been thinking about what, it, what I brought up so far. Uh, Lutzato came from a merchant family. He lived in Padua, he was born and raised in Padua. He studied Talmud and Jewish law and medicine at the University of Padua, uh, philosophy and Kabbalah. Kabbalah became the primary genre, his, his primary interest. Uh, at the age of 18, he was ordained as a rabbi, and he was celebrated even from a much younger age, and he published various uh, works even at a young age. He was part of a new rabbinic identity or form, which I've now termed Italian Hasidism. Hasidism, more broadly, is, is usually, it's usually understood in its Eastern European context. Um, this is really what this is, is that there had been generations there had been a tradition that the Italian the Italian rabbinate basically looked uh, it consisted of physician rabbis who also were involved who were humanists they wrote poetry and then involved in philosophy Luzzato comes out of a new strain where it would that had only been really three generations old uh, where the intention was to make Kabbalist rabbis it was to bring a pietistic view of things to the public uh, at, at the age of 14 or 15 or 16, something like that, Luzzato is, he, he gets heavily involved in mysticism and he joins a confraternity that, that eventually changes and sort of it reforms with him at the center of it. And this becomes a messianic group where he states that he has, is receiving uh, revelations from heaven uh, and they seek to overturn an establishment. It's it, the, the situation is such that um, they are, he and his supporters, the immediate circle, are the actual rabbinate in Padua. Uh, and they gain support from other Kabbalist rabbis in Mantua, Mantua and Reggio and elsewhere. So there's legitimacy from within, even though this is a young man who's stating that he has revel new revelations, which is itself novel. So it sparked fierce reaction from authorities who feared the, the heresy. And there were hundreds of letters to and from and about Luzzato sent throughout Europe. And there were bans that were issued against him and his group. And eventually he left and he went to, to Amsterdam. Uh, Derek mentioned that I'm working on this correspondence. There are, it, looking at the correspondence, this is using Palladio, the software from Stanford University. You can see that there are circles uh, and there, there, there's sort of what happens is a division within the rabbinates. And so I'm going to just jump ahead. What I see here is that from this Lutzato controversy, what it highlights on the one hand is that there's an epistolary network 
which is distinct from sort of how Derek was presenting it, as I understood it, that we're talking about communities of learning. There is communities of learning, but there's also an actual epistolary network in this case. And that rather than assume that there's a single rabbinate, we're talking about a multiplicity, multiplicity of rabbinates. And it gets to issues of, besides that there's scholarly, a multiplicity of, of communities, there's a dissolution of clear authority with all of this. And so getting to this larger question or the question about Republic of Letters here is that there, I, I don't necessarily buy the terminology in applying it to this particular situation, uh, to Jewish intellectual life in the early modern period because there's distinct Jewish political culture and there are rabbinic notions of authority. But what it does, what it has done thinking about this and working on this has made me consider more about what is community and how we define that community and its parameters, um, the importance of conscious and implicit relationships in community, and ultimately, broadly and sort of abstractly, I'm not sure how to take this in the future, but uh, the importance of meaning and intention when looking at uh, these individuals and these communities. So thank you. <laughs>